uh, throughout all of this, we've been uh, turning to uh, uh, someone who's been paying very close attention to the proceedings, who's helped us uh, with her perspective on it, Mary Ellen Trapel lafon who is a former Saskatchewan judge, a law professor at the University of British Columbia, and the director of the uh, residential Indian Residential School. Uh, Dialogue Centre, uh, History and Dialogue Centre at UBC, and she's with me once again from Victoria. Uh, Mary Ellen Trapelafon, thanks for uh, being with me again as we continue to follow this coverage. Uh, let me just uh, start with a very open question to you. Is what do you make of what you heard today? Uh, well, um, I think that um, I heard a few things that concerned me and it certainly did not lay issues to rest. Uh, and I would put them in two categories. One is about the role of the Attorney General and the conduct of the Prime Minister's office. The other is around the Cabinet shuffle. So uh, the first one around the Attorney General is uh, Mr. Butts's evidence was problematic in terms of the rule of law because when an Attorney General makes a decision, you do not push the Attorney General to hire outside legal counsel to tell you how to administer the law. I found that whole piece about Beverly McLaughlin, our former Chief Justice, the fact that they were pushing her to hire someone else, obviously they were pushing her to hire someone else because they didn't like her opinion. So that component shows to me a fundamental misunderstanding, uh, and it didn't square. Um, that left me concerned. I was worried about that aspect of it from a rule of law viewpoint, and I don't think uh, Mr. Butts's responses today were adequate. I don't think he was adequately examined on that issue, um, but he said that he got his advice from the PMO lawyers, mm -hmm. um, which troubled me because that's the chief law officer has made a decision, and you're pressuring her to get another lawyer to look at it. The idea that it's a new statute, so it's normal, that's completely unacceptable. That is not how it works. We have hundreds of new statutes and hundreds of provisions all of the time, and that just doesn't, is not part of it. Okay. Do, what did you make of the testimony of, uh, let's stay with what, what you're talking about, the, the idea that, I mean, the way he tried to frame it today was that, look, there, he framed it as persuasion, effectively, more than, than pressure. Uh, we, we wanted to m make sure she was availing herself of all these options, which we thought were legitimate, mm -hmm. to allow her to come to the best possible uh, decision. But the decision was hers and hers alone, but the best possible decision. We just wanted to make sure she'd availed herself of all these other options to make sure she was making the right call because we were really concerned about this and it was all very new uh, as you say. Uh, how did that ring for you? It, it just didn't ring. I mean I think that um, Mr. Butts has had time to think about this and um, apologies. He's had time to think about it. He's had time to develop a line which I've heard quite a bit this week which was we were just trying to bring more information and be helpful um, and I don't think that squares in any way. I mean essentially he's saying um, you know, former attorney general is wrong. And I just don't think his evidence squares because what he's trying to bring to her is to get her to hire another lawyer so that another lawyer can change her mind and they can present that to her and say, you have to do something different. Even on the issue, I have to stop on this and say, mm. a minister of justice, I mean, it, it's kind of humiliating, like the idea that she would pick up the phone call the Chief Justice, former Chief Justice of Canada, a titan in our legal profession, and say, oh, by the way, I need an opinion because they don't believe me on the rule of law. Like, it is just so offensive to have that line. And the fact that he, his evidence shows a complete lack of understanding of that, obviously the legal advice of the PMO and their strategy may be a political one, but the legal one is very flawed. And does it make, I suppose if you follow that, uh, and I'm not a lawyer, but if you follow that, that logic, um, uh, wouldn't it take you, so in other words, if she had decided, if she had decided to, uh, if the department had decided they were going to, or the director of public prosecutions had decided that they were going to, uh, make an offer, uh, for remediation to SNC-Lavalin, would the PMO have been just as insistent to say, are you sure? We better get an outside opinion to make sure that they deserve to have th this offer of remediation. Uh, I see you shaking this your is, head. This is, yeah. this is just preposterous. I mean, I appreciate he was a good witness. He was a calm witness. He answered questions in a polite way. And, I'm, you know, that's a valuable thing. But partially this shows why the Justice Committee maybe needs to be a proper inquiry, which is asking the 
chief justice officer, chief legal officer of Canada, an independent person who has made a decision to go and get an opinion from someone else because you don't like her decision and you don't think she knows how to apply the law is like is a position of incredible arrogance and judgment. I mean, it isn't something of, and it, it, the untrained people may say, OK, well, that's normal. That's what the cut and thrust of politics is like. But someone who's trained and attuned to the rule of law and the Constitution of Canada would say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Not only did you pressure her, you tried to get her to get an opinion and you tried to make her call the former chief justice. I mean, if I was the former chief justice and got that call from the minister of justice, I'd say, mm -hmm. excuse me, are you a trained lawyer? Yeah. Do you know what, what that role is What are you doing calling like? me? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so his evidence was so troubling. Now he's opened another can of worms, which is they were trying to get her to call Beverly McLaughlin so that Beverly McLaughlin would let them do this job. Like, this is just, it didn't answer the issues. Okay, I see. Okay, you're, you're back with us again. So you, you yeah. said you also want, and I, th th we, we did learn something new in this today, because when Jody Wilson-Raybould came before the committee, she uh, said she wasn't able to talk about what happened after uh, her time in cabinet, uh, that, 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 or, or after her time leading up during the cabinet shuffle, she wasn't allowed to talk about what happened. And, but he did today. He talked about those conversations. You said you were troubled about that. What, what was it? Well, I'm troubled about a variety of things. First of all, it doesn't make sense. I mean, this is a government that says they're so committed to reconciliation with Indigenous people. They've no, no one has ever been more finely attuned to reconciliation than Jerry Butts and Prime Minister Trudeau. Yet they bring her in and ask her to be Canada's Indian agent, to be the Minister of Indigenous Services, to give up in Ministry of Justice, become the Minister of Indigenous Services, which means she's going to administer the law that in the past was used to ban the potlatch in her community, take out the matriarchs that ruled her community and require her people to get a pass to leave the reserve. That's in, that's, and then he said, I guess I didn't understand how bad that might have looked. How is that possible? That is just, it just strikes me as either they are completely out to lunch on the Indigenous reconciliation issue or that he's, you know, this, this explanation just doesn't ring true. I mean, why would you move someone from Minister of Justice when actually the Justice Department is the most important place when it comes to things like innovation mm -hmm. for Indigenous people? Because it's where the brick wall is hit. It's where innovation is needed. It's where she was actually doing a good job. The idea that they're going to ask her to become Canada's Indian agent and administer the Indian Act because they're so reconciliation focused, it's tone deaf in the extreme. And I mean, it, it really, it's not going to go over well. And it doesn't seem to me to be a very credible explanation for that cabinet shuffle, shuffle and the reasoning in that cabinet shuffle. All of this is, uh, again, there's, we, you, you can't have this process that we're watching unfold without some level of partisanship. And uh, I, I mean, is, is there any question in your mind uh, as a judge uh, that Jody Wilson-Raybould has to be given the opportunity to come back before this committee? No. I mean, the, just the basic principles of administrative fairness are that people have a right to be heard. She's gagged about what happened from the time she was fired, and I'm still of the view that there's rational evidence that she was fired as Attorney General. She's gagged from the moment she's fired to the day she resigns. Yet Mr. Butts can show up and do this. In fact, I was disappointed that they didn't say to Mr. Butts, give us and table your order in council that lets you talk about all of this. Because it appears that Mr. Butts walked out of the prime minister's office with all kinds of paperwork in his hands. Um, you're supposed to relinquish the confidential paper on your way out the door. Um, and yet he's able to come and hold forth about all sorts of things. Who's having over for dinner? who he's talking to, his view of this and the view of that, a very casual uh, witness without having a discipline around it. And this is why I think the Justice Committee process, I appreciate Canadians want it, and it is the parliamentary process, but when you do come from a strong legal background about credible processes, you do be begin to get worried because you want to say, what's your authority to speak about that? If you have clearance for that... Yet, Minister, former Minister Wilson Raybould is gagged to speak about that. Uh, th th for administrative fairness, she has to come back and have a chance to be heard. But they also hold that string, which is why um, my view of it is uh, he's come out to try and re reinforce the positions that they've taken. And they may be um, 
so bunkered in that they don't realize that this is a fundamental rule of law problem, which is why the prime minister's office needs fresh air. I mean, they need to be refreshed. We need to maybe, this isn't about looking at the role of the attorney general. It's looking at the role of the prime minister's office. Okay, let me, let me finish on this. And you've touched on it a number of times, but for our audience, I want to, I want to give you the chance to distill it for us into, uh, because we hear, we're, I think we're hearing this more and more now as we watch this evidence unfold at the Justice Committee. And that, that is, we need another venue. And you've said it again today of, uh, we need a, an independent inquiry to look at this. And, and I'm not sure this is fair, and you can answer it any way you want, but if, if you could give me the three things that you think uh, a, a public inquiry or an independent inquiry would do, would get at that the Justice Committee can't, so that our audience can get an idea of, okay, why that would be a valuable process to follow, more so than the one that's being followed now. Well, I can give you one reason, because there's one predominant reason. This is a process run by a Liberal majority and run by people that run the prime minister's office, which is the office under examination. It has to come out of that process into a party that has the independence and ability to subpoena evidence, put people under oath, and get the story. Right now, the prime minister and the prime minister's office and the government is controlling it. The partisans on the committee, I appreciate they're trying, but it's clearly they're very act much acting in a partisan way. So it's a, it's a, it's a line of inquiry right now, but it isn't a truth-finding inquiry. Um, and without those requirements of appropriate examination, um, you know, it's a one-sided story. And they're voted down. I mean, a very simple res a very simple motion, like, was brought by both the Conservatives and the NDP around recalling the attorney, former Attorney mm -hmm. General or placing Mr. Butts under oath. Oh, no, we, we can't do that. Um, I mean, so we're following a parliamentary process. That's fine. It's a House of Commons process that's a partisan process. It's a five to four process with liberal majority on it, which means that it is still guided by partisan considerations. It's not an objective, neutral process with the normal requirements that would be there to make sure things are fully and adequately examined on a record. All right. Well, it's good to have uh, the, the one thing uh, that you can point to, and it actually it's better <laughs> than, than having to list three. It's the most important one. But as always, appreciate your time uh, to give us your perspective on this. And uh, uh, you know what? We may, be able, we may, we may talk again, uh, I suspect, <laughs> as this process continues, because I don't think we're anywhere and near done at this point after what we've heard so far today. But uh, Mary Ellen Lafont, uh, Terrell Lafont, thanks so much for your time again today. Appreciate it. Thank you.